This is unlike the Minnesota experience. I'm not proud of the fact that my state has uh, had a very robust spending pattern throughout its history, but we have begun to change that trend line. Minnesota has been a state for 150 years. We celebrated our sesquicentennial a year ago. So in 150 years, as far as we can tell, from two-year budget cycle to two-year budget cycle, spending in, by government in the state of Minnesota never actually went down until I became governor. And we've controlled the spending and we've actually cut it now in real terms for the first time in 150 years. We've also had the long-standing goal of getting Minnesota at least out of the top 10 in taxes. We used to flirt with number one, two, or three. I think 30 or 40 years worth of governors have said, can we at least get out of the top 10? Finally, a couple years ago, the Department of Labor, I think, or the Census Bureau said, Minnesota got out of the top 10 in taxes. I think we got all the way to like 11th. But we're making progress by moving Minnesota out of the top 10. I also just want to touch briefly on health care because it is so important. Let's not just be the party that says we're not going to do anything. Clearly, the health care system is broken. We have families and small businesses and school districts and counties and states and the federal government having their financial backs broken by the crushing weight of the cost of this current system. But as we do that, we have to be truth tellers and be commonsensical. I mean, listen to the rationale for the Obama administration health care plan and the one by the Democrats in Congress. It basically is this. We're going to control costs by spending more. That's like saying we're going to balance the checkbook by writing more checks. It ain't going to work. And we know that's not going to work. This is a scheme that would make Bernie Madoff blush. It ain't going to work. Now, another part of the plan, and there's so much and I won't go into all of it, but another part of the plan is they want to create a so-called government option to compete with the private sector in providing health care services. And the justification, the rationale for that is we want to keep, quote unquote, the private sector honest. Now ponder that for a moment. What's next, Chairman Steele? If the price of toilet paper is too high, if the price of uh, deodorant or toothpaste is too high, the price of the towels are too high, is the government going to start a government a Walmart or Target or Costco to uh, keep the private sector uh, honest and keep prices down? If we don't like the price of potatoes, are we going to have the federal government start a federal government potato farm to keep the potato farmers honest? I mean, it's an absurd proposition. And we need to fight that. So what can we do as Republicans affirmatively, positively? And the list is long, but let me give you some examples. And we should be able to join together with Democrats on health care reform on these things on a bipartisan basis. We need to get rid of junk lawsuits and have tougher standards for medical malpractice claims. We need to acknowledge that if you get sick, that shouldn't preclude you from getting insurance in the future. And so we need to prohibit and, and limit the ability of insurance company to box people out or f keep them frozen out of the insurance system just because of a pre-existing condition. We need to have what's called portability. So as this, in this mobile economy and mobile society, people switch from job to job. They don't have to risk losing their insurance every time they move jobs. And we have portability of the insurance product. We need to switch the system from paying for volumes of procedures to paying for better health care and better health care outcomes. We've done that in Minnesota and it works dramatically. But think about what we have now. If we're paying for volumes of procedures, what do you think we're going to get? Volumes of procedures. So we want to pay for better health care outcomes and make that pivot. We can do better in chronic disease management where so much of the money goes and we know that if we can get people to the best care, we can get not only better health care outcomes but more efficiency. And by the way, in the, in the internet world, why should I in Minnesota or you in Maryland or you in anywhere else that you are be limited in your health care purchasing choices to just your state? In the world of the internet, why can't I go on and buy my insurance with competing entities in California or Vermont or Germany or wherever I feel like it? Why does the government have to tell me my market is the basically three semi-monopoly health care uh, insurance companies or H&Os in Minnesota? 
let's open that market up for risk pools and purchasing. We need e-prescribing, e-medical records, the list goes on and on. There is loads of things that we can do to improve this system. And finally, I just want to touch on foreign affairs. Uh, we have as a first priority, a first responsibility for our federal government to protect and defend this nation and its people. Like you, I'm very worried about the threats that this nation faces. We need to remember that pretty speeches don't defeat or intimidate tyrants and thugs. We need to make sure that we remember, like I said earlier, that it is weakness that tempts our enemies. We have a situation now where President Obama recently said that he believes Iran has a right to develop nuclear energy as long as it's for civilian purposes, or nuclear capabilities as long as it's for civilian energy purposes. Now let me see if I got this straight. President Obama will not allow America to expand and develop nuclear energy, but it's okay for Iran to do it. And we need to stand with our friends who share our values and our principles. We need to keep our guard up. There's a lot of troubling signs on the horizon. There's some signals, there's some hints that maybe the administration will reconsider the anti-missile defense capabilities that had been planned with Poland and the Czech Republic. When you have allies who stick their necks out for us like that and take a pretty significant internal shin kicking about deploying and embracing those kind of capabilities, you can't pull the rug out from underneath them. Uh, Lech Walesa and Vaclav Havel recently wrote the Obama administration said don't do that, please don't do that. When you look at the defense budget you see things like a missile defense capabilities being potentially reduced in funding in Alaska and other places at a time when Korea, North Korea and Iran are more and more of a threat. And then you see a situation where the proposals to cut discretionary spending where 80 percent of the discretionary spending cuts are coming out of the Department of Defense. I think it's misplaced priorities given all the other goofy things the federal government funds. Let me just close by saying that to renew America, we as Republicans must apply the values that founded our party and made our nation great and guided it through all these years. As you know, I'm a Republican in a traditionally democratic state. We were able to cut the size of government. We were able to contain our tax burdens and move Minnesota out of the top ten and move forward with Americanizing our energy sources, reform our health care system, even with a divided government. We need that kind of renewal in Washington. We need that strong Republican voice in Washington, D.C. so that conservative solutions can address these problems and we're going to need it in our state capitals all across this nation. Our respect of those who don't agree with us is also an important part of moving forward. We need an opportunity to reach out to those who are not yet Republicans, not by becoming more like Democrats, but by getting more Democrats and independents to see the wisdom and value in supporting us. But as Ronald Reagan said, somebody who disagrees with us 80% of the time, I should say agrees with us, somebody who agrees with us 80% of the time isn't our, our enemy. They're our friend. And so we need a coalition that says, yes, we are going to be the Republican Party is strong and proud, but we're also going to have room for conservative Democrats and independents so we can govern with that coalition in mind. So let's be proud of who we are. Let's believe uh, what we believe, but let's make sure that we welcome others who are not yet Republicans to the opportunity to experience our values and principles. As Republicans, we led the nation through the Civil War and we ended slavery. We are conservatives and we led the nation in free market solutions that have created the greatest economy in the world and we're Americans, and we know that every challenge today opens the door to another opportunity and a brighter future tomorrow. So applying those principles to the issues of our time, I think is a great opportunity. It's what we owe ourselves as a party, it's what we owe our nation and our future. Nothing else, nothing more, and nothing less. Thank you for the chance to speak to you today, and thank you for what you do for our party and the conservative movement.